this one's a question for you, Steve. Steve, you wrote a book called Defying the Dragon in 2021. It's been banned in mainstream bookstores in Hong Kong. Your book illustrated how people of Hong Kong challenged, challenged the Chinese government in the face of repression. Could you talk about the dynamics of the Hong Kong-China relationship and its significance on civil and political rights, please? Very big question. Um, I, I think um, the, the essence of this matter is that for the first time in its history, China was um, felt obliged to sign an international treaty governing its behavior in part of its territory. That never happened in the case of Tibet. It never happened in the case of East Turkestan, which incidentally, according to Chinese law, are autonomous regions. Their autonomy is worth not even the paper that it's printed on, but that in terms of the official um, Chinese propaganda is where they, where they stand in relation to the state. Hong Kong is different. Hong Kong enjoyed a high degree of liberty before the um, takeover in 1997. Hong Kong prided itself on being this great intermediary between the East and the West. Great volumes of Chinese investment and trade flowed through Hong Kong, et cetera, et cetera. What has happened since is that the Chinese state, the Chinese Communist Party, kind of played along. They said, look, our main objective is to in, ensure the so-called reunification of the motherland, principal target being Taiwan, but Hong Kong will do for the meantime. And in so doing, they would make promises, quite lavish promises to the international community about what would happen after the resumption of sovereignty. What has happened in practice is there was this slow drip drip undermining of the autonomy that Hong Kong was promised. And then this flood, this gush, which was um, uh, prompted by the protests of uh, 2019 and 2020. Now, the Communist Party's apologists say, oh, if the people of Hong Kong had don't just shut up, um, they would never have had to face the kind of regime that now prevails. Well, the apologists need to read the state, um, the Chinese state document published in 2014, which actually outlined in great detail all the things that the Communist Party is now doing in Hong Kong, abolishing effective free elections, bringing the judiciary under control, ending the, um, uh, the, the tradition of free freedom of expression. All of these things were envisaged well, well before the protest broke out in 2019. So it is my contention that the Chinese state from the very beginning had always intended to subjugate Hong Kong because like all communist um, countries, control and power are the only things that really matter to the state. But the problem with Hong Kong is that in the period of a century and a half, when it was under colonial rule, Hong Kong developed very slowly, but then very quickly after the 1980s, a very distinctive identity, which emphasized the Cantonese culture, or to be more exact, the Hong Kong culture, which certainly emphasized the Cantonese language, which obviously is also spoken very widely without, uh, throughout Southern China, but most importantly, reveled in the liberty that was permitted, even though democracy was under the colonial period and thereafter very limited. So you had a whole population here that had, had smelt the heady atmosphere of liberty and that had to be suppressed and it has been suppressed very brutally. So where does Hong Kong now stand in relation to the rest of the Chinese state? I need to say as a preface, the situation in Hong Kong is not as bad as it is in Tibet. It is not as bad as it is in um, East Turkestan, but that provides little comfort. I mean, 
The fact that it's not as bad as these other places doesn't mean that the direction of travel isn't heading in precisely the same direction. The difference, of course, is that in Hong Kong, the majority of the population are Han Chinese, which is clearly not the case in, in either Tibet or East. Well, it, it is the case now because they flooded all these, these mainlanders into those places. But I mean, traditionally, they have not been centers of um, Han Chinese settlement. But Hong Kong is different. Hong Kong is composed of Han Chinese people. And, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, God bless them, are very interested in race. You know, I was a resident of, of Hong Kong for, for 34 years, but I could never get the, the famous three star permanent identity card because I'm not of Chinese race. So these things are very important to the Communist Party, which claims to be atheist and claims not to worry about race. It worries about race considerably. So I think the kind of genocide that you see in East Turkestan is unlikely to occur in Hong Kong, but subjugation will occur. And I think because the Hong Kong people have enjoyed liberty, they still have the spirit. It's being squeezed and it's being battered, but still have the spirit to resist. And you see this. I mean, Tenzin talked about how um, Tibetan people have been resisting. Let me just give you a small but very potent example of Hong Kong people resisting. When the, um, the authorities dismantled the election system um, to, last year and introduced this, this phony election system and then opened the polls this year, what did Hong Kong people do? They just stayed away. They just refused to take part in it. Of course, a minority of people took part, but by and large, the large numbers of people who took part in the 2019 elections just said, you, you produce a phony election system, you get on with it, nothing to do with us. So, you know, there is kickback. It's too dangerous to demonstrate on the streets of Hong Kong. It's too dangerous to publish so-called dissident publications. But I don't think that the battle for hearts and minds has been won uh, by the Communist Party in Hong Kong. Far from it. Thank you, Steve.